I'm Eric Marcus, and this is Making Gay History. When I listen to the decades-old interviews we've been sharing from the Studs Terkel Radio Archive, I tend to reflect on where I was in my own life when people like Leonard Matlovich and Jill Johnston were experiencing milestones in theirs. Or lesbian folk singer Meg Christian, who we're featuring in this final episode of our eighth season. As you'll hear, 1969 was a turning point for Meg. For me, that year mainly brings back memories of Mrs. Green's fifth grade class at PS99 in Queens, New York. But outside my prepubescent bubble, LGBTQ history was being made. 1969 was Stonewall. It was the dawning of the gay liberation phase of the movement. And for May Christian, it was the year of her feminist awakening, a new consciousness that found heartfelt and witty expression in songs that came to define women's music. Women's music was a movement all its own in the 1970s. It was about social change, feminist solidarity, and self-empowerment. And, more often than not, it was about lesbian love and pride. Not surprising, since lesbians were the driving force behind the movement. That's where Meg Christian played a major role. In 1973, Meg and a collective of like-minded lesbians founded Olivia Records. It was a groundbreaking independent record company for women and by women. What the Olivia Collective lacked in capital and experience, they made up for in talent and vision. Both on stage and behind the scenes, Olivia provided an antidote to the straight boys club of the music industry, and they put women's music on the map. The label's first album was Meg's I Know You Know, released in 1975. By the time Meg sat down with Studs Terkel in his Chicago studio, she'd just released her third album, Turning It Over. Let's join Meg and Studs for a conversation first broadcast on September 16th, 1981, and for a listen to some of Meg's classic tunes. We're going to make this sort of uh, an autobiography of three of your songs. Who is Meg Christian, a portrait? Well, let's go back to beginnings. Who are you? Where, where, Where it began and where you came from? Well, I was born in Tennessee in 1946 and grew up in Virginia and North Carolina. And uh, what else would you like to know? <laughs> you know beginning family, because... Uh-huh. Well, my father uh, taught in universities and colleges, taught in history, and uh, he died when I was two. And my mother um, raised me. I was the only child, still am. And she worked as a medical record librarian in Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, we, were, we were each other's family for my whole growing up time. And uh, so I spent lots of time by myself learning to play anything with strings, started when I was five playing a ukulele and promptly sat on it and had to buy another one and probably hit that one over someone's head and bought another mm-hmm. one and uh, finally worked my way up to, to a guitar. It was very much self-taught. I organized folk groups during the, the 60s in Lynchburg and, and we learned to play the guitar by listening to people like Joan Baez and the Kingston Trio and so Harry Belafonte was yeah. big. It was interesting because I stayed very much in my own uh, solitary shell until I got into college. I was not involved politically, but I knew growing up as a woman that I could not, I couldn't relate to the stereotypes, the stereotyped Im- social images of women that kept coming my way. Um, I knew that I was different, and I couldn't understand why my choices would seem to be so limited. Um, why the boys in the class looked at me funny when I asked too many questions. You know, there were all kinds of little messages that mm. something was amiss. And it wasn't until, actually, Eugene McCarthy ran for president that I, that I sat at a booth in front of the post office in Chapel Hill and gave out pamphlets and had no idea what I was doing. But that was the beginning. And so in music, it comes out of music, doesn't it? And Southern Home, this is autobiographical, I suppose, isn't it? Very much so. It talks about that... Um, very ambivalent relationship that most Southerners feel about the South, that intense love and intense embarrassment. And, uh, you know, you you grow up to believe that the South is a special, beautiful, warm, rich, cultural, social place. And at the same time, you you are taught to believe that it's got to be the most oppressive, uh, awful, place in the world for anyone, you know, who has any different ideas about life. And you grow up feeling that you're kind of ignorant because everyone always makes fun of Southern accents. 
Uh, you know, I used to listen to people on TV who had accents just like me and be embarrassed hearing them talk, you know, which is a little strange. And so for years after I left the South, I tried to learn to talk differently and pretended like I'd forgotten where I was from. And Not until several years later did I meet um, some people who uh, were proud of their heritage and who had learned to sift through and take what was beautiful and special and hold on to that. And some were even going back to to take what they learned to do political work in the South to help make change mm. in the, the place of their roots. Mm. And it moved me so deeply to hear them talk that I it allowed me to go back and, and see it differently and see, accept what was always in there, mm. the love. For Southern home. Funny, listening to the song Southern Home, talking to Meg Christian, who 
originally of Lynchburg, Virginia, and the University of North Carolina, talking about wanting to forget it, uh, roots. And one of the lines is, fleeing Confederate closet pain. And then what happened? Well, then I, I studied classical guitar for a while and moved to Washington, D.C., and found the women's movement and uh, the gay liberation movement sort of simultaneously mm-hmm. in the fall of 69 were starting up. And I was working in nightclubs, just singing any pretty melody that came down the pike. And I suddenly realized that um, I could take what I was learning and translate it into into my music and start singing songs that had true things, mm. positive things to say about women's lives, to give us a sense of the fullness and the complexity of our lives. Um, I realized that the, 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 the images of women in popular music were limited to say the, to be kind, mm. <laughs> insulting usually. Um, and I couldn't relate to them, and I wanted mm. to talk through the truth. I wanted to talk about my life to people who could understand my experiences, because there were a lot more of us than I used to think in my mm. Confederate closet of pain. <laughs> There had to be certain people, influences in your lives, weren't there? I mean, to make you feel freer. There was a movement, but there also had to be individuals, too, weren't there? Well, certainly. As I was growing up, I was looking around for role models all the time, you know, for women who had chosen non-traditional jobs, for women who had chosen not to marry. Um, you know, my mother was a tremendous example to me because she she lived you know, as a single, independent, working woman. And all the other uh, friends that I had had two parents. You know, the, the father worked, the mother didn't. And um, and so there were always people around. You know, I had a, a high school teacher who was a gay man who, um, who was incredibly supportive to me uh, at a time that I needed support because, of course, I was the only one in the world. Mm. To me, that's the essence of yeah. it to be reminded that we are not alone in anything that we're feeling. Mm. Because I think that will kill us faster than anything, Mm. is the feeling that we're alone. And that gym teacher, this is a special connotation, doesn't it? (laughs) This song. Well, this is a song off my very first album. And uh, it's a song about role models, about my eighth grade gym teacher who I absolutely worshipped because she was one of the first women that I ever seen in my life who was uh, having a non-traditional role. You know, and uh, she was strong, and she was beautiful, and she loved what she was doing. And I thought, oh boy, maybe maybe there are more choices in this world than I thought there were. So anyway, here's this song about my gym teacher. It's called Ode to a Gym Teacher.
her songs by Johnny Mathis. I gave her everything. A new chain for her whistle and some daisies in the spring. Some suggestive points for Christmas by Miss Edna Malay. You always be a player on the ball field of my heart. Yeah, isn't that tender? Yeah. It's tender and loving. Isn't it? What is it? Is is there a, a way of describing the difference in feminist music? Or maybe I don't want to force anything. You know. Well, uh, I prefer to use the term women's music. Women's music. Um, because for some people, feminism has a uh, people have certain put certain emotional connotations mm. or tend to narrow it. When I like to think of. Uh, I mean, because of course my music is feminist, um, and but essentially the way I would define it for myself is that is music that comes consciously out of my um, awareness of myself as a woman in the world, mm. what that means to me, um, the insights that I've had about it, and uh, that it tries to it tries to tell the truth, it tries to mm. give us positive images and give us support. I spent years of my life doing intense political work to help make change uh, within within the, the the idea of women's issues and women's rights. And at the same time, I was working so hard um, that I almost killed myself. I was uh, drinking heavily. I was um, n not resting. And I realized at some point that I was doing what um, what. I had been saying that the world was doing to me, you know, don't you all bother out there, I'll take care of it myself, and that I wanted to be around for this revolution. <laughs> and um, so for me, it starts inside myself, learning to change myself um, to create a life in which I can function. What can I do best? What can I relate to personally? Um, and what do I have the talents to contribute to? Who, who come to your concerts? Well, um, mostly women. The, all the concerts that I'm doing on this tour are open to anyone. Um, an increasing diversity of people in the audience. You say mostly women. Young women? Do you have, do you have old women? Too? Oh, yes, definitely. Lots of uh, generations we have coming now. Lots of young children. You know, when I think about what my life would have been growing up in Lynchburg, Virginia, if I had heard this music when I was 13 years old, I would be a different person. When were you first aware that something out there? Well, it wasn't when I was in Lynchburg, Virginia, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I had to really wait until I was in college. You know, and that to me is the exciting thing, is that the music can travel sometimes where we as uh, physical bodies mm. can't get to. Mm. And the music travels and goes, and we get letters from tiny towns where you think, where on earth could they have heard that album? And they hear, and they know that they're connected. They're connected, and so their lives will never be the same. Is there, is are there places where you where you where you're considered controversial? You name it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, a, a women's production group in uh, Boston doing a concert at Harvard almost got sued. 
um, because we wanted to have one uh, open to everyone concert and one all women's concert. And one guy who wanted to come to the all women's concert and refused to believe that anything could legitimately exist without his presence sued the production company. Mm. No, it happens everywhere. But in Smyrna, you said you performed at Salt Lake City. That's right. Well, just a few days ago we were there. Or was it yesterday? <laughs> what happened <laughs> anyway. Um, it was very exciting. It's one of the first concerts of women's music that they had there. And this uh, is Mormon country. Uh, mm. You bet. <laughs> um, I remember I was singing uh, one song that I do called Leaping Lesbians, which is on my second album, Face the Music. It's a very funny song about the stereotypes that many of us carry around inside of us, even though we pretend to be ever so open-minded. Um, and I said at one point, now I want you all to sing this with me loud enough so they can hear it all the way over at the tabernacle. And this gasp, <laughs> kind of, you know, everyone kind of went gulp, yeah. you know, as though we're not sure we want to sing it quite that loud. But, you know, the act of coming to that concert, uh, whether or not you were a lesbian, whether or not you were just anyone who was open to new ideas and to some support just for the idea of being a whole woman in this world, it was a risk. It was a personal, professional risk. It was a political act to come to that concert. And so the energy and the bonding that was there was quite amazing. Mm -hmm. There were over 300 people there. Mm Meg Christian largely retired from the music scene in 1984. She moved to an ashram in upstate New York and adopted a new first name, Shambhavi. She's recorded several albums of devotional songs and lullabies and works at a nonprofit that spreads the spiritual teachings of Siddha Yoga. Olivia Records transformed itself into Olivia Travel, a company that designs vacations for lesbians and LGBTQ plus women. Since 2002, Meg has performed on several Olivia cruises, revisiting her classic hits for adoring audiences. Many thanks to everyone who makes Making Gay History possible. 
Senior producer Nahani Rouse, co-producer and deputy director Inga Detaya, researcher Brian Faree, photo editor Michael Green, genealogist Michael Leclerc, and social media producers Christiana Pena and Nick Porter. Special thanks to Jenna Weiss Berman and our founding editor and producer Sarah Burningham. Our theme music was composed by Fritz Myers. Making Gay History is a co-production of Pineapple Street Studios with assistance from the New York Public Library's Manuscripts and Archives Division and the One Archives at the USC Libraries. Season 8 of this podcast has been produced in association with the Studs Terkel Radio Archive, which is managed by WFMT in partnership with the Chicago History Museum. A very special thank you to Allison Shine Holmes, Director of Media Archives at WTTW Chicago PBS and WFMT Chicago, for giving us access to Studs Terkel's treasure trove of interviews. You can find many of them at studsterkel.wfmt.com. This episode featured the songs Southern Home and Ode to a Gym Teacher, written and performed by Meg Christian, courtesy of Thumbelina Music and Shambhavik Records. Leaping Lesbians was written by Sue Fink and performed by Meg Christian, courtesy of Terra Music and Shambhavik Recordings. This podcast has been made possible with funding from the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, the Calamus Foundation, proud Chicagoans Barbara Levy Kipper and Erwin and Andrew Press, and our listeners, including Eileen and Tad Smith, Amy Kispe, and Brad Prunty on behalf of his husband and pioneering activist, Tony Russo. Thanks, Eileen and Tad. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Brad. In case you've just recently started listening to Making Gay History, while we're working on our next season, I suggest having a listen to some of our previous episodes from the past four years. You'll find them at makinggayhistory.com, along with archival photos and additional resources. Or you can listen to Making Gay History wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to be the first to know what we've got coming up next, go to makinggayhistory.com and sign up for our newsletter. So long. Until the next season of Making Gay History.